Uh, if you're joining us uh, live stream this morning, uh, thank you for be- tuning in and, and being with us. Uh, we love you and, and uh, pray for you and are so glad that you're worshiping together with us. This is a July 4th weekend and, you know, I was thinking uh, uh, the Statue of Liberty, many of you have been there, seen it, and some of you haven't, you, you know what it is, you've seen pictures, but at the base of that statue, uh, Lady Liberty, there are, I don't know if you knew this, but there are chains at her feet and they're, they're broken chains. And the idea is that freedom is something that means that we've been set free, set free. And it comes at a cost, you know that. Freedom always comes at a cost. Being set free comes at a cost. We think about the Revolutionary War. Think about the Civil War, which brought freedom to slaves. Tremendous cost, more lives lost in that war than, than any war that we've ever experienced. So we get that, and and so we're thankful today for those who paid for freedom for us to be able to celebrate on this weekend. Amen to that. Aren't you thankful for that? And the country that we live in, it's fantastic. And and I love the songs we were singing this morning uh, because it talks about that freedom that we have in Christ because that was a cost that was tremendous, that was paid for you and paid for me. Jesus paid it all and he broke our chains that were holding, held, holding us down and brought freedom into our lives so that we can know him and experience him. Well, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been fantastic being a part of uh, MVF here. and I want to talk this morning for a few minutes about um, I Live. That's, that's kind of the title of our, our message this morning, I Live. And the idea here is that Jesus didn't come to make bad people good people. In fact, what he did come for was to make dead people alive. He came to make dead people alive. You have a purpose, and your life has meaning to it. When you're living for yourself, life is dull and it's meaningless, but for those who've been born into the family of God by the Spirit, who's not a ghost, the Spirit, uh, everything changes in our life. And we don't live that same uh, aimless, purposeless, directionless, meaningless kind of a life that we used to live before Jesus. It's, it's changed. Now, two passages of Scripture will guide us this morning. The first is in Romans 12, 1, and uh, I think we have that on the screen. There we go. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Isn't that a great scripture? Here's the other verse that I I want to have it define our journey today. This one is from Galatians 2.20, and would you read this one with me out loud? I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless, I live, pause for just a second. That's the name of the message, by the way. I live, right? Okay, just want you to see that. Okay, let's keep going. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the grace of the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, our new purpose for life is to help people see how great our God is. And this would be a a great way for us to pray every day, by the way. I know a lot of times our our prayers are like, God, give me an easy day. (laughs) Help everything to go smooth for me today. Help me not to have any problems today, God. Don't let there be anything uncomfortable in my life today. But how about praying Lord, help me to live my life today in a way that people can see how great you are. That's kind of revolutionary, isn't it? Now, the world is going to see for sure how great God really is. 
is either going to happen at the end of time when everyone stands before him and they're going to realize that he is way beyond their wildest dream. I'm not sure how many of us really even get it as to how great God is. We're all pretty happy that Jesus came to earth and he lived among us and he died for us and, and we enjoy a personal relationship with him and he's the friend that sticks closer than a brother. But sometimes we lose sight of the fact that he is God, almighty God, and that he's terrifying in every way. And I, I know some of us get a little freaked out about that kind of thing. It's like, I don't want to hear that. I thought he was nice and loving and gentle and patient and, and stuff like that. He is all of that, but a lot more, much more. He's Abba Father, my friend, but he's also, whoa, time out. I'm awestruck. I'm speechless. I'm overwhelmed. I'm terrified by him. Check out this scripture, Romans 14, 11. As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will confess to God. So at the end of this life, everyone is going to see him. The people who said they don't believe in him, they're going to see him and they're going to believe in him <laughs> at that moment. And all the people that ordered him around all their lives are going to see him and they're going to stop ordering him around in that moment. And all the people who've had all their questions and comments and called him into judgment are going to stop doing that at that moment and they're going to bow down and say, I've got nothing to say to you. You're the greatest thing I've ever laid my eyes on. You're stunning in your perfection. In fact, you're scaring me to death right now with your radiance and your brilliance. And everybody on planet Earth is going to see how great our God is what we've sung about this morning. But our life here right now is to help people see how great God is. Before that day, that's what our life is gonna be about right now. So if you're taking notes this morning, our life is helping people to see how great our God is and that they will have a chance to enter into a relationship with him, with the great God before their life ends. Now the way that the world is going to see how great our God is is when we display that in our lives. So let's talk for a few minutes about how we can do just that. I know we all get pumped up by grace. We sang about it this morning. This is amazing grace and the, the, the incredible love of God that pursues us and chases us down and, and overcomes everything uh, uh, after us. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. It is amazing that God would forgive all of our sins, not just the easy ones, all of our sins. Uh, isn't that amazing? And we don't have to work to make that happen. Isn't that awesome? And then he invites us into this personal relationship with him and we can talk to him and boldly enter his presence, not based on our behavior, but based on his invitation of grace. That's incredible, incredible. And grace doesn't stop with salvation. I mean, we continue to live every day in the acceptance that he freely gives to us. I'm not exhausting myself trying to make him love me or keep, keep him loving me. I rest in that grace. God's grace enables you and I to have a relationship with this perfect, holy God. But it doesn't in any way diminish who he is and his awesomeness and his perfection. You know, when Jesus was on this planet he showed up in a town one day and there was a guy who was demon possessed there. And it's interesting because the evil spirit knew exactly who Jesus was. Jesus didn't have to introduce himself. By the way, I'm, I'm the son of God. <laughs> it's like, you know, uh, and it wasn't like the, the demon had to say, well, who are you? you know? uh, no, it, it was like, hey, as soon as Jesus walked up, the evil spirit speaks and he says, I know who you are. Have you come to torment us? You're the holy God 
the Holy One of God. So yes, he is love and he's grace and he's gentle and kind and yes, he's awesome and powerful and he has a terrifying righteousness and even an evil spirit recognizes this and says, I know who you are, you're the Holy One of God. Is this it for me? Am I finished? The answer is yes. You're done here. (laughs) You're finished. I I believe that the people that God is going to use to show the world how great that he is are people who embrace the grace of God but also the fear of God. So we're going to have intimacy and awe working at the same time in our lives. That's how we display how great God is. Intimacy and awe. Living a life that says, oh yes, I I do know Jesus. I've got relationship. I've got bold access with him. But I'm in such awe of him that I tremble before him because he's the holy one of God. And my life is constantly being refined because of that. Now, we'll never be able to show how great God is. In fact, you know, we'll never even know how great he is if our lives aren't in a process of being refined by his presence inside of us. And if we stop being amazed by his righteousness and overwhelmed by his brightness and perfection of who he is and how great he is, we'll aggressively avoid any of the refining process. We we won't want anything to do with that. And we'll be doing everything we can to not stick out or be different than anyone else in the world. And, And congratulations are in order for folks that are aiming for that, to not stick out, because you did it. <laughs> you achieved it. You, know, you wanted to not stand out and you wanted everyone to be amazed at how, at how cool you are and, and you won. You're no different than anyone else. There's no light in you that shines out in the darkness of the world that you're living in. Our entertainment and our leisure activities and our priorities and, and how we spend our money and what our ambitions and dreams are, they're indistinguishable from anyone else. We did it. But no one is seeing how great God is in that scenario, right? I'm not so sure that most of the stuff that we're listening to is going to be played in heaven. I'm I'm not so sure that most of the stuff that we're watching is going to be in heaven. I'm not so sure about whether all that we're concerned about making sure that nothing else is going on so that we can watch whatever we want to see, you know, the big game on TV or whatever, And I'm not knocking sports because I love sports and later this afternoon I'm going to watch sports. (laughs) I'm I'm a big Dodger fan as a lot of you know and I watch them all the time. But this is me talking to me. Okay? Because really now we can get so passionate about some stuff that really doesn't have eternal value. And we want to get passionate about the things that have eternal value. I love the way that John opens up the gospel that he wrote He said, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then we pick up in verse 14. Check this out. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his what? His glory. Okay? Now, so the disciples who had committed to following Jesus and being with him, they'd seen some amazing things. They saw evil spirits cowering before him and release their hold on people's lives. They saw blind eyes open. They saw lame people being made to walk. They saw dead people being raised up. They saw him instantly calm a big storm while they were in the middle of the lake. And on another occasion, they saw him walk on water in the the middle of a storm. And you know what their response was? They were afraid. They trembled. It's like, Oh, oh, oh. This, is, this is intense. John was with Peter and James on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus' face lit up like the sun and his clothes became this dazzling white and Moses and Elijah were with him and a voice from heaven said, this is my son, listen to him. And you know what their response was? They were terrified. They were all there when the woman who had been very ill for 12 years secretly and very discreetly reached out to touch 
just the hem of the robe that Jesus was wearing and, and she was instantly healed. And Jesus knows that something has happened in the moment he stops and he asks, who touched me? And everyone's saying, what an insane question. We're all jammed in here like sardines. It's like shopping on Black Friday. I mean, everyone is touching all of us. But then he, he locks on to her and she got, she'd got just a little part of the hem of his robe and, and he knew it. That's how awesome that he is. She's completely healed and she kneels down before him and she's terrified. Terrified. You might be thinking, well, that's not the right response. <laughs> Shouldn't you just be happy and excited and joyful? And, and uh, no, she's freaked out because she realized that divine power had just entered her body. And she looks up at him in fear and trembling, knowing that he was the healer of her. That's the awe that I'm talking about. So, Back to John 1.14. The word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Here we go. Grace and truth. Grace that helps us understand that it's not our efforts that bring us about, brings about the work of God in our lives. The works don't save us. The works don't change us. Rules don't impact our lives. They don't change us. They don't save us. It's grace. It's not legalism. It's grace. And then we live with the balance of grace and truth because he came full of both, grace and truth. I, I know well-intentioned people have tried to make sure that they didn't compromise the truth, so they retreated and they hid themselves away in a, in a little place, and we're just, you know... We're gonna make sure that we don't dress cool <laughs> and we wear our hair funny and we don't participate in anything that's going on in culture because we just wanna be different and we're not gonna be able to relate to anybody on the outside and no one the, on the outside is ever gonna be able to relate to us because we won't even be able to talk to each other. And all I can talk about is a verse of scripture. I don't know anything about anything else. I don't hear anything that's going on around me. I don't watch anything. I don't know anything that's going on on TV or movies or music. I've never heard of Top Gun Maverick or, Mi or Minions 2. <laughs> I don't know anything about the Whip Nay Nay or the Stanky Leg or the Floss or TikTok. I don't know anything about that stuff. I don't go out, I don't get out, I don't look out. And that might be very well intentioned but it seems to be different than the way that Jesus was. He spent a lot of time with messed up people, sinners, because that was his mission, his mission. That's who he came for. So we have to embrace grace and we have to embrace truth in every area of our life. And when we do that, it changes us into his likeness and people will see that. They will see how great our God is. I want you to see how both of these work together as we read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Peter writes this, Therefore prepare your minds for action, be self-controlled, set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. See both of those things at work in that passage? Talks about the grace, but he talks about the truth of holiness. When we see him, see, it's gonna be absolutely mind-blowing. Remember John, the one that calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved, okay? He's one of the inner circle. He was, he was tight with Jesus he was an insider. And, and some years after the resurrection, he's in the spirit on the Lord's day, at Sunday, and he's transported into heaven, and he hears a voice like a trumpet speaking to him. And check this is out. This is uh, Revelation 1.11. This voice speaks to him and says, write on a scroll what you see and send it to seven churches, to Ephesus and Smyrna. 
And he says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. Well, that, that'll, that'll overwhelm you. <laughs> you see that? I mean, in the bedroom, in your living room, and nobody had been closer to Jesus than John on this planet, okay? He was close. But he hears this voice telling him to write, and he turns to see who's talking to him, and his, his mouth pretty much drops to the floor. And he goes on, he says, his feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword and his face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. And when I saw him, I said, hey dude, what's happening? <laughs> no. When I saw him, I, I thought, I'm gonna sing a little worship song trying to think of one that might just be appropriate. No. When I saw him, I was glad to see him because I had some questions that I wanted to ask him uh, for a long time. Like, so what's a good church to go to anyway? It's like, or how did I get stuck on this island of Patmos? What's the deal with that? No, didn't ask any of that. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. That's his response. That's the fear and the reverence of the Lord. It's not being afraid of God. It's more just getting it. This is who I'm dealing with. Wow. It's understanding grace and truth. It's like I understand who you are. Lord, I want to be in the world. It's, it's this kind of heart that prays this. Lord, I want to be in the world, but I don't want to be of the world. I want to be here where you placed me so that I can help others see how great you are. And I want to be able to relate to other people and enjoy the things around us, but I don't want my life to be so entangled and confused with the things of this world that no one looking at my life can see how great you are. So here's John, he's on the ground, he's afraid. And the scripture says, then he placed his right hand on me. That's grace, that's grace. And he said to me, do not be afraid. There's no reply recorded, but if there were, it might have been John just scribbling a little note. It said, Read this. Yes, I am afraid. Your face is so bright, it's blinding me. And your eyes are on fire, and there's a sword coming out of your mouth, and your voice is scaring me. It might just be better if I stay on the ground here for a little while. I don't think that anyone is going to really change the world until they've experienced a little bit of that. We need to experience some of that in our life. I am overwhelmed by your greatness. Yes, I'm thankful for the grace, but I also see who you are. And there's something in me that just takes my breath away. I fall down on my face before you, and I'm terrified. Not afraid of him but just the awe of who he is. And I think every one of us ought to have some kind of experience like that before him at least one time in our lives. Blown away on the ground with your face down, absolutely overwhelmed by the revelation of who he is. And Jesus said to John here, I am the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead and behold, I'm alive forever and ever and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. Why? Why does Jesus say that to him? So the people will know who I am and how great I am and what's ahead. 
And in case you've forgotten or you didn't know, you and I have an appointment to stand before God and to be accountable for our life. And if you've made your life all about you and your comfort and your leisure and your possessions and your hobbies and your priorities and your ideas and your politics and your values all the stuff you've contended for all the stuff you accumulated you'll be standing before him and have nothing everything will evaporate everything you've held dear everything you've worked for just evaporate before your eyes because that doesn't have eternal value let's wrap up this morning back in 1 Peter 1 verse 14 as obedient children do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance but just as he who called you is holy so be holy in all you do for it is written be holy because I am holy and since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers but with the precious blood of Christ a lamb without blemish or defect he was chosen before the creation of the world but was revealed in these last times for your sake through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him and so your faith and hope are in God in chapter 2 verse 9 he says this but you are a chosen people a royal priesthood a holy nation a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Here's what God is saying here. Show the world me by the way you live. Show the world me. So that's our prayer. That people will see how great our God is by our lives. And let's pray this together this morning. Worship team's coming back up to finish up our service, but let's just pray for a moment. Lord, may we just take some inventory today of our thoughts, what we entertain ourselves with, how we talk, what we talk about, what we give our lives to, how we live, how we serve, how we leverage what you've given us so that people through us will see how great you are. May we live our lives that way. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.